Hollywood studios are suing, or at least trying to sue, thousands of Canadians for allegedly violating copyright by downloading and sharing movies and TV shows using BitTorrent. I'm often asked what you should do if you receive a notice delivered by your internet service provider about alleged file sharing, or more seriously, a registered letter containing court documents. In this video, I hope to provide some basic information about these copyright lawsuits in Canada. Hi, my name is David Fraser. I'm a privacy internet and technology lawyer with the Canadian law firm McGinnis Cooper. I also teach internet and media law at the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University. In this channel, I try to provide educational and informative content about Canadian privacy and technology law. You should check out the full disclaimer below, but you should know that I'm about to give you a very high level overview of a pretty complicated and nuanced subject. It's a rapidly developing area of law with lots of procedural and substantive details. If you are dealing with any of these issues yourself, you should get experienced legal advice right away. And any opinions expressed are mine and mine alone, it should not be attributed to the firm or any of its clients. Over the last number of years, hundreds of Canadians have received registered mail, generally from a law firm in Toronto, that includes court documents that look something like this. If you get one of these, you are likely being sued by a Hollywood studio for alleged copyright infringement. Using a relatively novel legal procedure, many Hollywood studios or production companies like those listed here are consolidating what would otherwise be hundreds of individual lawsuits into just a handful of lawsuits. Different studios are taking slightly different paths through the court system and are fighting hard to try to get their pound of flesh from users who participate in peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. At least one of them went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada on a procedural question. These lawsuits generally follow a set process. The studio identifies people sharing or downloading movies online, usually using BitTorrent. BitTorrent is a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing protocol, which is often associated with illegal file sharing, but also has loads of lawful uses. Users of BitTorrent are often not aware that when you are downloading content, the software also makes that content available to others to download from your computer. Some torrenting software will, by default, continue to make that file available to others, even after you're finished downloading. And by making that file available, your IP address is visible to anybody who wants to look for this particular file. Of course, that one IP address may be unique to you, or it may be shared among many, even hundreds of end users. So the studios use similar but specialized software to scour the internet looking for companies or computers that are sharing their movies. They will note the date, time, and the IP address, among other information. The IP address, unless hidden by a VPN, will tell them what country you're in and who your internet service provider is. Under amendments to the Copyright Act, rights holders can require internet service providers to send notices of infringement to the owners of the identified IP addresses and to require the internet service provider to preserve the customer data associated with the IP address. These notices were being abused for extortionate settlement demands, so changes were made in 2018 prohibiting that particular practice. But if you get such a notice, your IP has been logged, but the rights holder likely does not know yet whose IP it is. The rights holder can get that information with a court order, which they often do. So the studio sends each of these people a notice through their internet service provider that asserts that the person's activity infringes the studio's copyright in the movie under the Copyright Act, and also demands that they stop. If the studio later identifies one of these people downloading or sharing the same movie, it will consider them to be a target for their litigation. Apparently, most of them send three notices this way before adding the person as a John Doe in litigation so that they can show up in court, say that they're dealing with the worst of the worst, repeat offenders. You know, as an aside, I'm not sure that's really the case. If you leave BitTorrent software running, it will often continue to share the files you've downloaded. So laziness or just lack of awareness of this fact is just as likely compared to the person being a master pirate. The studio then starts a single lawsuit against these alleged downloaders of one particular film, calling each of them a John Doe. That's because it doesn't know their names yet. In some cases, there are hundreds of John Doe defendants in a single suit. The studio then makes an application to the Federal Court of Canada for an order requiring the relevant internet service providers to identify the customer account holder based on the IP address associated with the activity they've identified. 
With this customer name and address, the studio then serves that customer with a statement of claim for violating the Copyright Act, because at this stage, they've actually connected the IP address to a particular John Doe. Many, many people in Canada have now received a statement of claim from the Federal Court of Canada identifying them as one of the John Doe's in their lawsuit. So what's being alleged? The claims generally allege that the John Doe's are liable for direct infringement under the Copyright Act, which means that they themselves were the individuals who made unauthorized copies of the film in question and made them available. They also alleged authorization of infringement, which means that the internet subscriber defendants sanctioned or approved of infringements carried out by other individuals using their internet connection. They also allege, and this one is much more of a stretch, that the ISP customers are liable for secondary infringement under the Copyright Act, which means that the defendants sold or distributed the movie or exposed it for sale or distribution knowing that it was infringing. None of these have actually gone to trial yet, though hundreds of defendants have settled with the studios. We do have a sense of the arguments and evidence being put forward by the studios, though, because Voltage Pictures recently tried to get default judgment against a group of John Doe's that it alleges downloaded and shared the movie Revolt. You've likely never heard of this movie, since it only made $15,000 at the box office worldwide and $50,000 in DVD and Blu-ray sales. Now, if you really want to see it, it's free on Amazon Prime, and you can rent it on YouTube or via Apple TV for about $5, but it's likely not worth it. But regardless, I suggest you not torrent it. So default judgment is the process by which a plaintiff in a lawsuit can go to court and try to get a judgment against a defendant or defendants who did not defend the lawsuit. Under the federal court rules, the claims are assumed to have been denied by the defendant, so the plaintiff still has the burden of proof on a balance of probabilities or a more likely than not legal standard. But the evidence that the plaintiff puts forward is still going to be uncontested. In this case, the Canadian Internet Policy and Public Interest Clinic from the University of Ottawa was granted the right to intervene in this particular case to make legal arguments on behalf of the defendants and also in the public interest. All three alleged bases of infringement failed because of a lack of evidence. The decision gets into the legal weeds, not surprisingly, but here is the finding in a nutshell. So the plaintiffs allege direct infringement. Essentially, the defendants are themselves responsible for making the movie available through BitTorrent. The court essentially said he can't make that assumption. We don't know how many people live in that house or use that IP address. They need more evidence to make that connection and lead to that conclusion. The plaintiffs also alleged infringement by authorization. This means that the default defendants did something more than just permit it to take place. The plaintiff said that by sending the takedown notices three times, the defendant was on notice of what was going on and should have seen that it ceased. By permitting it to continue, they said, the court should assume that the default defendant authorized it. Again, the court said this failed because of lack of evidence. More evidence of the nature of a relationship between the defendant and those who actually uploaded the unauthorized content was needed. Also, there is no evidence as to what steps, if any, the internet subscribers have taken to prevent further alleged infringement. That makes a lot of sense. I've seen these statements of claims sent to landlords, Airbnb hosts, and even internet resellers who don't live at the service address and have little to no control over the users of the internet connection. Now, surprisingly, the plaintiffs also allege what's called secondary infringement. In order to establish secondary infringement, the following test must be satisfied. A, there must be an act of primary infringement. B, the secondary infringer must be shown to have known that he or she was dealing with a product of infringement. And C, the secondary infringer must have sold, distributed, or exposed for sale the infringing goods. There was no evidence of that. They couldn't even prove the primary infringement. So in the end, the default judgment application failed, but the court did say they could come back and try again with better evidence. Not surprisingly, this looks like a setback. And also not surprisingly, it is being appealed to the Federal Court of Appeal. There's no doubt that these studios are putting a huge amount of effort and cost into a blizzard of lawsuits, and this is not going away anytime soon, unless an appeal court like the Federal Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court of Canada ultimately shuts it down. The court on this default judgment application did note that there are ways that the plaintiff can go to the defendants and require them to give evidence related to their involvement. 
The plaintiff suggested that this would involve getting an order to seize their computers, to have them forensically examined. But it's clear that there are less intrusive steps they could take. I'm not sure that was an idle threat, since they are clearly motivated to intimidate people into settling. The court also noted that there was no evidence about how much of the copyrighted work in question was on each defendant's computer. From paragraph 57 of the decision, while this is sufficient to conclude on this sub-issue, I note that the evidence is also thin as to the portions of the work made available through each IP address. This represents a further evidentiary challenge to be able to conclude that infringement has occurred in each instance. However, in view of my findings above, I need not delve into this further. This is because torrenting works in swarms, where a downloader is getting pieces of the work from many other people's computers. It is possible that some of the defendants just had a small piece of the file on their computer which was being shared. That sounds unlikely, but the burden of proof is on the plaintiff to prove that any infringement is not insubstantial. For anyone who actually receives a notice like these by registered mail, the court did conclude that anyone who received it by registered mail was properly served. They are defendants in an actual lawsuit in the Federal Court of Canada. If you get one of these, you should immediately seek legal advice from someone who has dealt with this before. Now, we have a group of lawyers at our law firm with this experience, but other firms can likely help as well. I would also suggest contacting the Canadian Internet Policy and Public Interest Clinic at the University of Ottawa Law School, since they've been doing a lot of public interest work on these files. I hope this has been interesting and perhaps useful. I try to put out a new video each week, so if you're interested in this sort of content, please click the like and subscribe buttons. Also leave a comment if you have any questions or if you have any suggestions for other topics to cover. And of course, feel free to share this with anyone who you think may be interested in hearing about developments in Canadian tech and privacy law. Thanks for tuning in.